Right, okay, so I'm going to brush up on what the uh, what the six. Sam, we're live. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to our uh, uh, sermon workshop. Uh, my name is Reverend Sally Hitchner, and this is Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. And um, we have been throughout with you throughout the whole of the pandemic, barring a couple of few weeks of holiday around Christmas, um, uh, in order to that we might prepare our sermons together. Um, we realise that now is both a more pressured time for preachers, but also maybe more important than ever um, that we preach and engage uh, positively and creatively um, with um, the texts. So uh, the way it works, if you're new, uh, is uh, that Sam and I discuss uh, each of the uh, texts of the common lectionary, um, and we sometimes include other texts, but I think we're not including anything else this week, are we? Um, no. So I think actually everyone around the world who follows uh, standard liturgy is uh, going to be doing the same text. So um, please uh, do stick within those. So if you're preaching on something different this week, that's wonderful, but we're not going to be able to cover it um, here. We have to wait till that passage comes around. Um, uh, and uh, uh, But we are going to be able to talk a little bit about preaching in general, and we try and sort of weave in um, how do we preach in our context now as well as uh, what would you what would we preach from those texts so sam um this week uh it just feels like more of the same we're about to, we're about, we'll, we'll be the first sunday of lent um and uh we were going to look a little bit at ash wednesday we covered it a bit last week so do go back and look at last week's um session if you uh, are looking to preach on that but if people are in a total panic and haven't yet managed to do it and have had a major pastoral crisis of the weekend uh, and uh, just are thinking, what on earth am I going to preach tomorrow for my Ash Wednesday service? What would you recommend? Uh, well, I think dust. I mean, you, you know, your default Ash Wednesday sermon is about death. Uh, clearly, the last 11 months have made the general public think more about death than at any time, probably since the uh, well, since since the Cuba missile crisis, I would guess, or, or since since the concerns about nuclear disarmament in the in the early eighties, um, so so I think the default is is to get in, in touch with our own mortality, uh, and 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 you know the, the simplicity of Ash Wednesday is it confronts God's eternity with our our mortality, um, and you don't have to say a whole lot more than that, really. You, you know, I don't think you need to go into details of ashing and burning palm crosses and things. You, you, you want to stay with that very raw contrast between what lasts forever and what lasts for a limited time. And so, simple message is, well, the what simple message is, is, is uh, we need to invest as God does in what lasts forever. You know, God, God for, for our sake, invests in what lasts for a limited time, us, that's called the incarnation, uh, that we might forever uh, invest in what lasts forever, which is God. And it's that exchange, if you like, that, uh, you know, Ash Wednesday highlights, it seems to me. And and really, it's, it's an inventory. We're being invited, rather as we are when we prepare for making a formal confession, we're, we're being invited to make an inventory of those things in our life that anticipate forever and those things in our life that are kind of let's grab what we can uh, because there's a very limited uh, limited amount of time to play with and um and how would you actually land that in people's lives at the moment because i think people are expecting a sort of take-home message aren't they um in in the Ash Wednesday thing, sort of what, what should they do for Lent that probably engages with that? Oh, I would say make an inventory. You know, I would say actually sit down and make, make two lists. What in my life, life is about forever uh, and what in my life is about passing things. And, um, you know, we're all giving ourselves a little bit of slack, I think. Uh, certainly Lent for me is not going to be as rigorous as it usually is in terms of giving things up because of that sense that... Uh, we, we, we've we've done a lot of going without, um, but the the general principle of Lent, which we you know we'll come on to in looking at the readings, but uh, uh, that that sense of originally preparing for baptism, you know, of, of of actually reordering our life so it's ready for eternity, 
Yeah. Uh, you know that that I think writing to to you know an inventory of of the, of the things that are about forever and the things that are about uh, you know over investing in our limited existence you know is is a good is a good practice. And I guess in a sense the looking at the readings as a whole, the idea of baptism is that we are all dead and we've all died um, and we followed Christ into death and, and into resurrection. So we are modeling that sense of, of, which is quite a powerful thing to talk about at the moment um, this year with, with it being so present, I think. So, um, you know, baptism is always about two things. It's always about both washing and drowning. Um, and I think you can say the same about the pandemic. You know, some things have died, some people have died, many people have died, and some things of real value have died, institutions that can't survive, uh, cultural, artistic, uh, hospitality. Um, people. Uh, yeah, as well as the people. Um, you know, a lot of things have, have died that, you know, we, we grieve. Um, so that's the, the dying. But there's also the washing that, you know, all the build back better is is actually this is a refiner's fire. Uh, you know, so you can see uh, that, that, ba that baptism is in that sense an appropriate metaphor, but you've got to you've got to handle it carefully because it is always both of those things. And of course, they they're slightly contradictory. Um, and that's that's inherent in the character of baptism. I mean, they're kind of contradictory in everything else apart from the Christian faith, the idea that death does not mean good <laughs> there can't be anything beyond death that's kind of the definition um dead means the end um uh, in, and yet in the christian faith there is something beyond that and and i think most people have spent a huge amount of the last year the last 12 months being running away from things that might kill them um and being mindful of of death um, and afraid of death. And I think this list of yours that, where we write down the things that will carry on beyond our death, um, the things that will still have meaning beyond the grave, um, actually is something to hold on to. I think there's a real anchor in that, um, that, that individuals can believe that love and um, in particular God's love and, and all the things that we are building that are within that um, will will go beyond this ending um, I, th I think christianity is is based on you know it's not unusual to say you know a fundamental choice but a fundamental difference in worldview one worldview is that you know we have a limited amount of time uh, and we need to stash away everything we can a bit, a bit like being in the candy store you know we're given five minutes to stash it into our bag all all the stuff we can get in five minutes in the candy store uh, and then try and get as much of that out of the door as <laughs> as we can. You know, that's one view of, uh, of, of, of life. Uh, another view is to say if something's of true value, um, everyone can have it. I can perfectly well share it. So, so the first one has a, you know, a clenched fist of the grabbed thing that you don't want to let go of. And the second has an open hand of, of you know, of a sharing posture that says it's as much yours as it is mine. The things that last forever are the things that you you hold in in, a, in hands like this, you know, and 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 it's a it's a very simple uh, contrast. But but I think life does come down to more or less that simple contrast, and and the danger of people's response, uh, quite, you know, quite understandable to the pandemic, is to take the first approach to revert to the first approach. You know, there are only so many hospital beds, there are only so many ventilators, there are you know there are only so many va right. so much vaccine. Yeah. Lee I'm going to grab and, as much as I can yeah. before before uh, before the whistle blows, and uh, you know that is not living in the light of eternity. And I think I think there is um, there is and is the light of eternity. I mean that's that's the thing that creates these things that will last forever is because they are infused by something eternal. Um, they're from something someone eternal. They're they're, they're not finite. And and I think that's the that's the contradictory message with the Christian faith and the rest of many other philosophies in the world is is death is the ultimate finite, but actually that that there is something other there are things that are infinite. Um, well, there is resurrection. Eternal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I there's mean, an eternal so, God. I think yeah. is really where I was heading with that. Um, right. And so the um, eternal God creates the possibility of a resurrection. 
Yeah. Yes. So it, 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 Ash Wednesday is, you know, we're really here to talk about Lent one, aren't we? But but Ash Wednesday is is, if you like, the 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 day of the year when you can you can put things quite starkly. I, I think it's about being brief. Uh, I, I can't think there's much reason for a, an Ash Wednesday sermon to be more than a homily, really. But I think you, you you can do just as much in a brief homily as you can in a in a long sermon. And I think setting that kind of contrast and then locating it within the mortality uh, of of the pandemic is you know is the obvious way to go for this Ash Wednesday. Yeah. And and we touched briefly on our reading, so why don't we jump into those now? Um, Genesis 9, verses 8 to 17. I was surprised how much I liked this. I was not expecting to like, it seemed to me like it was, when I first turned to it, oh, this is just the wrapping up of the flood story. But actually, there's a lot in here that, that you know, to me, this is all I want to preach on from the flood now. Um, okay. Well, I, mean, there's... I think there's two ways you can go with this. Um, there there is um yeah so i mean first of all there there is the notion of the covenant um and you know there are clearly well at least four covenants that you can discern in the early chapters uh of the torah and this is the first one uh and there is you know there's one with with abraham there's one with jacob there's one with moses um you could say there's one with david um, but if you, if, if you, I guess, ignore the Jacob one because it's pretty much the same as as the Abraham one. You, you can think of four covenants that make up <clears throat> this notion of covenant in the Old Testament. This is the first one, uh, and there's a lot to be said about covenant. Most obviously, in this case, uh, the last line in the reading nine seventeen, the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh. That is on the earth. You know, the grammar of that translation isn't fantastic, but but um, mine says all you know, life. That, the, um, the all, yeah, the all, all. I mean, that that is that is big picture covenant. You know, that's clearly not just with Israel. That's clearly not just with me. That's clearly not just with humanity. Yeah. Um, so you know that that's so that would be the first way to go. And then I think the other way to go with this reading would be for me the, the you know that the, the the significant thing that's unique about this reading the covenant stuff you can talk about other readings but the the, the two crucial words about this reading are in 911 interesting um choice I'm not sure they were thinking um, about that. Yeah, I'm not sure they were thinking <laughs> about that um never again so so never again sets up the whole dynamic of the bible because if you take the uh, the conventional Bible story, humanity was given everything, uh, screwed it up, uh, God destroyed everything, uh, then we get God saying, I am not going to destroy everything again. That's no longer an option. So this sets up the whole dynamic of the scriptural story, which ends up with Jesus, because if, if God isn't going to destroy the earth when the earth gets it wrong, you know, obviously the next option after Noah is, is uh, Israel, is, is Abraham. Then obviously the Old Testament tells the story of how that, from a Christian point of view, uh, still isn't a happy solution to this problem that's set up at nine verse eleven, but never again will will I will I destroy uh, the earth. So we need to find another way to get out of this problem of, of humanity's failure to keep the covenant. And of course, the answer to that question is Jesus. So, so you know, there's a, there's a never again is a, a, is just such you know those I, I you know I love a style of preaching that that comes back to a refrain of never again and those two words are so powerful pastorally because you know they're about liberation from fear which obviously speaks very deeply to almost everybody um you know imagine someone saying who was in a position to say it at the end of the pandemic this will never happen again you know they're they're, they're profoundly liberating words that we don't get to hear very often so and in this case, of course, it sets up the whole dynamic of the Bible. So if you want to preach a sermon that's about whole, the whole scriptural narrative, 
then you'd probably call it never again and and you'd look at never again throughout the scripture but also um on a pastoral level uh, if you want to do a more general uh sermon that's about a a, a profound covenant uh, and you know if it were me i would always contrast that with the notion of a contract um that this is about a covenant this is about how god relates to each one of us and how god relates to the creation uh coming out of the flood then you know th those are two very interesting sermons for me i think they're, they're both illuminating for the congregation they're great fun to put together and they you know they, they perhaps you know the difficulty is in keeping them short enough to be a sermon because there's so much you can say about them I mean, I think I think it's it's more than just lack of enmity. Uh, like, so I think I probably will go down the line of um, the the Hebrew word for rainbow is the same word for the word bow and arrows, and the idea of God placing His bow in the sky, so away from reach. It's it's up there, like it's the 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 weapons of war are far away from God. Um, but I think that the sense of this is actually it's a covenant. It's a commitment to loving, steadfast loving kindness towards this people group, which is, is it's more than just absence of warfare. There is this commitment to stay with. Um, and there's this really interesting um, reference to it. In, in, interestingly, the um, stuff in about this, this, this reference to the covenant and, and Noah in particular is referenced loads of times through the Old Testament. And in particular, there's a great one in Isaiah 54 verses nine to 10. Uh, as I swore uh, that the waters of Noah should no, no more go over the earth. So I, I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you, for the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And and one of the interesting things I've I've been thinking about as I've been preparing this, this sermon is that this was all written down and definitely reflected on in the Isaiah passage at a time when Israel was under enormous pressure to feel abandoned and where there was all sorts of terrible things happening where people probably were saying where is God what has God is God not are we not God's people anymore um, and actually I think this sort of never again language is quite difficult to preach on in the middle of a pandemic where the whole world is suffering from admittedly you know something that you could argue has some link to human failure but but actually the the, the magnitude of it just feels cataclysmic and definitely could be cataclysmic. Um, but actually what you find, I think, in the exilic literature and this, in this Isaiah passage is, is this reference that, that there is something bigger. There's another explanation to what's going on and that God is with us in suffering is um, the bigger story rather than God will fix our lives for us. It's not just a God won't let bad things happen, um, but God will commit in this loving steadfast Thing. And I'm really tempted to reference the, um, you know, the hymn that um, I love that will not let me go with its line of um, I trace the rainbow through the rain. Um, Very good. Um, and there's a great story behind that if everyone's looking for an opening story. Um, but, but how would you preach this? Um, well, I think your thing about the bow, again, can fit within the covenant uh, and within, within the never again. I, I would I would be pushing back about the pandemic. I, the pandemic isn't a flood in that sense. It is uh, an illustration of the way, I'm slightly exaggerating, but, but it's an illustration of the way in the 20th and 21st centuries, we've come to assume that disease is something that can be managed, certainly in the first world. Um, and this is something that defies management. And we are completely, speechless in the face of, of of a natural phenomenon if one can ever use such a phrase uh, i i don't go with the human cause thing i think that's speculation and i wouldn't pin my mast to it mm. certainly not a theological mast um that uh our inability to to manage it has confronted us with our limit the limitations limitations of growth of the economy which we've taken for granted maybe shouldn't Certainly, a lot of the ecological people say we shouldn't, um, and 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 the limitations of our ability to control, you know, events. So, you know, the sea is is a is a very good example of something that uh, you know, going back to baptism, has both drowning 
and washing. You know, there are very good things about the sea. It's lovely to swim in it and so on. It can be incredibly destructive, tsunamis and uh, and so on. You know, it, it is both welcoming and frightening. So uh, I, I, I think there's always a time for never again, because I think the, it, it, you know, in the end, those are words of salvation. They, they are words that say, um, you know, when when you've been through a traumatic childhood and the person chiefly or wholly responsible for that traumatic childhood dies, you can hear words like never again in a very powerful way. I'm not saying you killed that person or whatever, but you have every reason to suspect that that nightmare of your life is over. And so that sense that, that you know that you actually can feel you have escaped something that you have got free of something and and of course you know forgiveness is supposed to be about a similar kind of release and and clearly so is eternal life so it's you know such a profound pastoral thing um but i'm you know I'm, i love talking about covenant and contract and i love talking about the abiding uh, steadfastness of god in the way that you have and so i'll look forward to, to you preaching that sermon if it's the one you, you do i think they're both you know you the mistake is probably to try and preach both sermons uh, i think they are subtly different one is really about change never again and the other is really about continuity which is the, the covenant and the staying with so to try and get them both into the one sermon, I think, is probably being a bit greedy. Would you go anywhere near questions of whether um, the flood, what well, the historicity of the story and the sort of flood narratives and other cultures and whether Noah existed or no. you would? It's, I mean, I think I think sort of it's that's just showing off. It's it's not actually helping anyone. Um, I don't think it gets us anywhere. So this is clearly a mythological story. I mean, I, I don't go yeah. around saying to the congregation, this is a mythological story. What are you doing in a church, you idiots? I mean, I, I'm, I don't do that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I talk about what the story means for, for Christian understanding, for its significance in the rest of the Bible. It is, it is part of our tradition. Mm. Uh, what, what does it tell us? You know, if it, if it was an actual historical event, how do, how do you, evaluate it as a historical event what matters about it is to say is the words never again they, you know that the, the, that is the important part of the story that god is god however you know understandably cross god gets at, at human failings god is not going to destroy us finally and hmm. um, and would you go down the line and talk about god getting so cross that god's patience ran out and god destroyed most of humanity um, I don't think, you know, to me, this, this is about the, the Noah story is about the end of the way the story ends, not the way the story begins. I remember going to see the film Noah. Um, I was asked to go and see it, to comment on it, you know, before its um, release, which was very flattering. I mean, it's a terrible film, though. And, and the most risible part of the film was their attempt to describe, to portray depravity. They, they had to sort of put on screen how depra depraved people were that they deserved. And of course it couldn't be done, uh, you know, it, so so it's a parable. That's fine, Job is a parable. Uh, so is the, the, the full narrative. You don't have to go on about the negative sides of that. You, you say, what is the, yeah, I mean, I treat it, you know, like a novel, like a film, but obviously it's it's integral to our tradition in the way that a novel or a film wouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, and so you say, you know, what are the motifs here that are doing some serious work? What, what, are, what, what do we take away from this? What do we learn from this? What does it show us about the character of God? The whole idea of, you know, we found a mountain which the ark could have rested. No, 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 no. Although no. I'm kind of interested. Apparently, there's a life-size ark somewhere in Texas. Um, um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is, and all the all the animals and and, and so <laughs> what happened when they had children? We never find that out. Oh, they don't go into all that detail, do they? Um, Edward Hopkins asks whether it's um, helpful to contrast it with Jonah. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot of stories in these passages that you can like. We have two other other passages to link to, so I think for me, okay, you don't so, want to add too many more in. But would yeah, you? Jonah, um, Jonah. Yes, I mean, I think for a more sophisticated congregation, they're both arguably 
meditations on the exile if you want to go there you know that the 40 years well we're told the exile was 50 years but you know it was a, a good long time the 40 weeks years you know obviously in other words israel is coming to terms with how on earth it ended up in exile it it, it recognizes that there's some degree of punishment there um we have that in the Jonas story about jo Jonah running away from his vocation. Perhaps Israel was running away from its vocation. Perhaps Israel was very sinful, which is more like the Noah story. Um, out of both of them comes a renewal of vocation and a renewal of relationship. So, and they're both about water, which for Christians obviously will come on to refers to baptism. Uh, and they're both you know, significant motifs in the idea of death and resurrection of Jesus. So you can, you can put them both together. I, I'm, you know, with all due respect to my own congregation and other congregations that I've served, that's, you know, that's a big, um, that's a big piece of pie to, 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 to take I'm out. I'm not sure know. it's what people need right now. Um, in in our congregation, at least. Maybe I think it's a really interesting. I think for for a, for a you know for a the yeah, Oxford chaplain or something. <laughs> Maybe. Well, uh, you need to have quite a high degree of scriptural literacy, which you can't take for granted in most congregations. But it's a really interesting point. I'm going to move us on. Um, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. Again, another passage that I was thinking, oh, this is, doesn't sound great. And then I got into it and thought, wow, this is brilliant. And it also ties into what we were just discussing in Genesis. How would you preach this? Yeah, I, I, th I think this is, um, this is a, a text if you want to say look lent is 40 days of preparing for baptism historically that's how it came into the church's tradition uh, and it was a time of you know how would you spend 40 days as you were preparing for the most important day of your life uh, and a day in which you you know became a different person in a sense that in the early church you know becoming a christian was was a very radical thing to do which probably set you apart from your family and I think you can literally change your name so um you can pick yeah. a new name so that so all of those sort of things so i i would pick out the baptism part of this and and it doesn't say a great deal about baptism but it refers uh you know to uh to noah and draws that into uh, uh the, the sort of metaphorical world of baptism um, and so I, 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 have, I don't think I've ever preached on this passage um, because it, it could, you know, it looks like in the in in verse eighteen, it looks like it could be a a sermon about suffering or a sermon about Christ's uh, Christ's atonement. Um, it just doesn't quite, and, and it's got that very strange verse nineteen. Nobody really knows what it means. It doesn't. Know, what does prison mean? It's. Uh, is it connected to Noah? Is it connected to those who died before Christ's resurrection? Nobody really knows. So I, I just, again, I, I would be reluctant to pin my hat on and a big theological claim on a verse where nobody's really agreed on how it should be translated. Mm. Um, you know, that's, that, that's, uh, but, but the, the, the notion, and I did write about this, I think, in, in one of my letters to the congregation early on in the um pandemic period you know around about last april that, that you know there is an element of noah uh, you know and the pandemic you know we had a period of um of floating on the water and then we had a period of you know when 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 the waters have stopped rising but but nothing's still happening and and then you have a period of of, of obviously um regeneration once you get back on land it's just it's not as simple as it looked last april may we thought it was going to be a simple narrative then it went into a you know a, a sort of double dip uh so you know I, i'd be more reluctant to, to portray the pandemic quite so simply through the noah story uh, as as a, a, a more, more reluctant than i was um maybe nine months ago I think what I get from this passage is, I mean, I realise it's like incredibly complicated and there's all sorts of different interpretations, but what you get is God's boundless love um, and reaching out to the whole of humanity and the opportunity for everyone, but but also the opportunity for everyone to sort of symb symbolically die, to sort of go under and not just to sort of really get rid of outward dirt, but to sort of really 
um, engage with Christ in death and resurrection, um, and and the possibility of the of the limitlessness, like we were talking about earlier, the the sort of limited versus limit, limitless way that we engage with um, salvation. I mean, I, it's hard to escape. Um, you, you know, first, the first thing that you know you, you always need to remember about these readings is that whoever wrote First Peter wasn't writing short little paragraphs that were suitable for preaching on a Lent one two thousand years later. You know, so there's a sense of squeezing a, a quart into a pint pot here, yeah. and it's a difficult passage to lift but out. I mean, we're of leaping one from Peter it, three. aren't we? We sort yeah. of like take find a verse that makes us happy and leap from that into <laughs> what we really want to say. Well, <laughs> I, you speak for yourself, of course, but um, but uh, you know, I recognise what you're saying. Um, so I think, but what you have got here in the last couple of verses is both what I'd call the lyric and the epic dimension of baptism. So you've you've got this line appeal to God for a good conscience. You've got that that sense of personal change, that sense of change of mind and heart and soul on a personal lyric level. And then you've got in the, in the last verse in this in the quoted passage, three verse twenty two. You've got angels, authorities, pow powers, the whole, you know, shooting match of heaven. Uh, you've got that sort of on an epic scale. So you, you know, you have got the sort of embryo of a theology of baptism, which is not only personal transformation for the individual, but is a kind of motif of the transformation of the cosmos uh, in the resurrection of Christ. So you know, you, you've got enough to work up a theology of baptism and locate that. The question is whether baptism is the right theme to be pursuing. Um, well, you know, I'm a bit worried about like, how do you, I don't want to preach too much on the resurrection in the beginning of Lent, you know, you're sort of, you need to save some of your cards for Easter. Um, <laughs> but, um, like, but, but I mean, I guess baptism is the way in. It's, um, it's well, we, about... we, you know, we tend to read the Lazarus story uh, in Lent five, I, I don't. I don't think we need to withhold the resurrection. Uh, you know, if we really did preach the resurrection seven Sundays straight at Easter, then fine. But I don't think most people do. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that's fine. I, and I do think a theology of baptism is 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 you know is 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 no bad thing. And at the moment, I'm not. Um, other than the kind of which reality do you want to live in that we started our conversation with a while ago uh, this afternoon, I I'm not sort of seeing the, the the thing that's urging me to say this Sunday is the Sunday to preach about baptism. I'm not feeling that, you know, and, and I if I'm not feeling that, then I almost would, you know, almost never would go with it. It's got to, it got to feel like it really matters in the current context. It, you don't necessarily have to comment on the current context sometimes it speaks for itself but um i'm not quite you know baptism of course it's a defining identity mark of christians um i'm just not quite seeing where that connects with our with our current experience in the so, midst of the so pandemic. if you were preaching on this uh, we've gone around the house a bit if you were if for some reason you couldn't preach on the old testament <laughs> and the gospel wasn't available because you know for i for some reason there must be something um what would you preach on from this passage ready steady preach what would you go go with from from here well i, I think it's a straight choice so um we've we've got we've got that, that I, I think i would go with the first line i mean i've talked about baptism and outlined that you know the epic and the lyric sort of parts of baptism but i'm just not connecting that with you know with the, the urgency of our current moment so i, I would go with the first line and um, I, I would probably preach a sermon called Once for All. You know, it, it may sound like quite an old fashioned, uncompromising well, that does sound very, very doctrinal sermon. sermon, but you know, the, the, it's got a lovely contrast in it. It's probably such a familiar phrase to many people that you could miss the contrast. Once is, you know, a limited, finite thing. All is an infinite, in, you know, expansive thing. And that sense that Christ has died and therefore we don't need to do that death because he's done it on our behalf. And it's not just about him and me. It's about the whole cosmos. You know, it, it ties in quite closely with the themes in the in the Noah story. Uh, you know, uh, it, it never gets old. I mean, it's a, it, it, it is 
for the you know the righteous for the unrighteous that that that, that uh, in order to bring you to God. So so again, you know, to bring you to God is is such a generous open phrase. Mo most of our language about why Christ died is you know is quite closed and controlling. It's precisely to do the following things. But bring you to God, you know, it it is um you know, I, th I think the kind of metaphor, the kind of narrative I'd be looking for in literature or in the movies or something to to, to illustrate it would would be quite a, a basic longing. Could be, you know, for my own story. I don't know. Um, a, a basic, you know, sometimes you think when so and so comes, everything will be okay. Or you know, Anthony Trollope novels are full of if so and so hadn't gone on some European trip. They would know the answer to everything and everything would be resolved and of course the last chapter they always come back and everything is resolved um so that sense of christ's longing to bring us to god you know that 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 the power of that and that somehow as long as we're with god nothing else really matters so you know that would that would probably be the ready study preach sermon for you hmm. um uh I'm going to go back and do some of the early comments, so don't don't worry. Um, but Edwards also talked about Bonhoeffer wrote Hapax, the uh, Greek word for once and for all, on the on the wall of of his seminary in, in Finkelwald. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, and I think it's also interesting to write it in the context where there's enmity, um, like and where you're surrounded by people who are against you or you're against, and and I think that idea of once and for all. Um, and the generosity of that is quite a powerful ethic as well as a theological belief. Um, and uh, that's very, that's a very one Peter theme. So, you know, you mm. could, you could preach a more encompassing sermon about one Peter in general, which, you know, doesn't do any harm now and again. Yeah. It just doesn't um, feel very Lent one to me. <coughs> Lent one is quite a great. programmatic Sunday, I think, for the big theme like covenant or like never again. I think, we, you know, we need a big theme for Lent one. Um, Liz said the phrase that's jumping out for her is uh, that 1 Peter 3 verse 21, an appeal for God, uh, uh, appeal to God for a good conscience. What do you think that means? Yeah, yes. well, as I say, I, I put that down as lyric because good conscience feels, you know, a little bit domestic, a little bit parlour, um, a little bit um, uh, close to home. Uh, 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 yeah, and, and, and not quite big canvas. Um, so appeal to god um yes but i i i have to i don't think i would be going down that route because you know appeal to god feels like you know your last stand your last words are crying out to god and then what you're appealing for is a good conscience which just doesn't seem like quite enough it, it, you know it, it it feels that the contrast there is is too jarring for me um uh, it doesn't for me work unless you include the, include the subsequent verse, which puts it in a big cosmic um, epic context, which, which is, uh, you know, I think if you've got both of those, then I think it's fine. But just to take that line on its own, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. OK, Liz, you've got your marching orders. If you can right. combine it with the second one, uh, you can preach on that this week and let us know how it goes. Um, I'm going to jump us back. Nicola Ann was asking about, I think it might have been the Genesis passage, but it might be this passage, um, saying uh, it's a great way to touch on how we should care for the planet. Environmental issues hardly get preached on. They do in our church. Um, yeah. uh, so, uh, 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 though, it's, uh, uh, though it speaks into our Christian lives today, it's so relevant. What would you say about that? Yeah, yes. I mean, that's the point. I think we just touched on it, but but she's absolutely right to uh, push us to say a bit more about it. Uh, it is all flesh that is on the earth. I mean, it, it is it is as sweeping as it can get. Uh, mm -hmm. And absolutely, that sense that God is making, not just that we need to make a covenant with the rest of the earth, which is the way the ecological movement sometimes seems to put it, but that God has made a covenant with the whole earth and if we want to be in a covenant with god we need to be in that covenant with the whole earth do you see what i mean it's, it's yeah. a subtly different point it's basically saying get with the program god is yeah. god has this covenant with the earth it's about time we joined in with it 
I always remember Ben Quash talking about this, maybe writing about it, maybe even, um, uh, and talking about the uh, relationship that God sets up in Genesis, which I think there are overtones of this sort of Genesis story and the Noah story with God walking with Noah and God walking with Adam. Um, but the idea that if God is speaking to the creation to go forth and be multiplied, to be fruitful, um, there's a relationship there. And if God is speaking to creation, maybe even creation in some way can speak back to God. And so could you, are you really comfortable with exploiting and, and destroying things that have a relationship with God? Um, and, and he was arguing against things like exploitative factory farming and, you know, all those other things to do with animals in particular. But, but I think you could extend it to the whole of the creation that, um, that, that there is this covenant between God and the creation and, and, and for us just to use creation as if it's expendable. Um, it seems to just be out in out, out of step with that. Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I don't put, uh, you know, when I wrote the two books, Incarnational Ministry and Incarnational Mission, I had to think about where being with creation would go. And I resisted the temptation to put it under mission <clears throat> because of that sense of humanity has got to go out and sort out its relationship with creation for ecological reasons. Um, and I put it in, in, I think it was chapter three in Incarnational Ministry, because uh, I, I basically see the, the earth as given to us as an instrument through which to worship our creator. So, you know, in that sense, it's part of discipleship, it's part of ministry. And so the, the idea that God would have given us something as a way to worship and we not only don't worship with it, but we actually misuse it uh, in a way that destroys its ecology and makes it unsustainable. You know, that to me, that's a much better way of configuring where our sin lies. Uh, otherwise, it just sounds like greed or um, thoughtlessness. But, but to, you know, that's the way I would configure the problem. And so we are we are breaking the first covenant that the Bible refers to in in not cherishing our ecological heritage. I'm going to be devil's advocate. That's obviously something I never do. Um, but I'm going to stand with Claire, who's suggesting that Noah does quite a lot of sacrificing when he gets back onto dry land. And you could even argue that there's quite a lot of destruction of creation in the flood. Um, is that not undermining your point? Um, I, I think we have to read it Christologically. I mean, you know, this is a typological passage quite, quite evidently for me. You know, we've talked about how the 40 days of the flood mirror the 40 days of Lent, Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, uh, Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, that sense that Israel is spending all that time in exile, which is more or less 40 years, maybe 50. Um, you know, this, this, this is about, as I, I think I said earlier, this isn't about studying the details of the flood itself or the reasons for the flood. This is about the resolutions that are made coming out of the flood. Uh, you know, never again uh, a covenant with with everything. Uh, you know, if you take the, the 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 traditional reading, the catastrophic effect of Adam and Eve's fall, um, the way that's played out in the Cain and Abel story, and you know that that sort of those sort of scenes of depravity, whatever depravity it particularly involves, in I think Genesis six, you know that then you know, then the flood is perfectly justified but by, by the terms of the narrative. Uh, God rejects the creation, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's where the never, you know, you've got to feel the power of that never again. God will never again do that. I think as far as sacrificing is concerned, again, I'd read that Christologically, that the sacrifice was clearly a very central part of how Israel showed God that God came first. God got the first fruits of everything. Uh, it was a sign of fidelity. It was a sign of obedience. It was a sign of honoring God. But if you believe that Christ is the last sacrifice, then you, 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 you know, once for all, to coin a phrase from, uh, from the epistle, then, you know, then, then Christ is the end of sacrifice. So, you know, we're not called to make those kind of sacrifices anymore.
I'll uh, put my sacrificial sheep away for Sunday then. Um, I'm going to move us on um, to our gospel passage. Now, people, as you often say, um, Sam, uh, we should generally try and preach on the gospel passage where we can. This is Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. Um, what would you preach on this? I'm not sure I say we should always preach on the gospel passage. Uh, I I mean... Usually or often. Yes. Um, well, unless there's a good reason not to. Like you, um, like you I'm not sure I follow that. Way. I'm not sure I follow that advice. But, but um, you know, the problem with this passage is there's only one verse here that's really a Lent one verse or two, maybe. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by sin, sin, Satan. He was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. You know, the, so it could be a two verse gospel. And for, for whatever reason, the compilers of the Revised Common Lectionary decided two verses wasn't enough for the gospel. Because, you know, you can see what they've done. They say there's a year of Mark, there's a year of Luke, and there's a year of Matthew. Lent one is about temptation. And obviously there's a very full narrative in Luke, slightly different order in, in Matthew, but the same constituents. And, you know, the traditional Lent one sermon is about temptation. Well, they've linked both baptism in the first verse and Ash Wednesday in the final verse in the fifth, verse 15. Um, yeah, well, that's very nice if, 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 you know, if you want to do that. But I, but I, um, I it, 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 it is a, it is a, uh, it is a challenge to, to, to preach on this because you're going to be, you know, you're obviously going to be struck by the points in this passage that aren't about the usual themes of Lent 1. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to die for the lectionary. It's not, you know, it, uh, but but uh, but if you take Lent seriously, then, then you really need to be thinking about a, a sermon on Lent 1 that is setting people up for the 37 days that are left and uh i'm not sure it you know you're going to be drawn away from that if you're preaching on the whole of this passage so um i i, I what i would do with this is i would go to the word that is mentioned i would concentrate on those two verses and more or less ignore the rest uh and i would um uh i i would preach on on, on the notion of wilderness uh, you know, I, I think that's a very appropriate theme for our experience in the last 11 months. Uh, I think it's a very profound theme in the life of Israel. If you think of exile as a kind of wilderness, then you've got these two parallel wilderness experiences that the 40 years after leaving Egypt and the 40 or 50 years in Babylon, and you've you've you you're helping people face up to the fact that an awful lot of things in life are not the way we'd like them to be and and we look back and we realize there were quite a few wrong turnings there we'd like to believe that god was hand was by us you know at every moment but you know we could say i spent a long time in the wilderness after i dropped out of college or yeah. after that toxic relationship or you know, when I was try struggling to overcome an addiction or, or, or whatever the circumstances are, that you could say, well, a lot of my 20s, frankly, I don't remember or, or whatever. Um, and, and yet wilderness is such a profound and, and desert more, more generally uh, are such profound motifs in, um, of course, John, John the Baptist emerges from the wilderness. You know, you, you, you could do an awful lot with lessons learned in the wilderness, you know, with a sermon, of, of, you know, with a, a whole biblical theology of the wilderness that includes post exodus, that includes exile, and that includes today, you know, that brings that yeah. forward. And, and ideally, the clincher would be if you if you located a point in church history, which you could look back on as a kind of wilderness, uh, that gave us hope for the wilderness that we might find ourselves in now. But you know the 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 shape the dark of the pages, sermon, maybe with all of the mystics. Um, well, the the shape of the the the, the sermon is, is one where you 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 are surprised to find hope in what seems to be a, a you know a a, a a a situation of of grief and adversity and and you know the the point's worth making that the Bible is not full of happy stories of people. You know, slapping on each other on the back and watching Forty Towers again. It's you know, it it is uh, 
it you know a lot of it is through the night of doubt and sorrow and and that you know, doesn't seem yeah, to be an accident. People find find God in the wilderness. You know, the point yeah. is not to escape the wilderness. The point is to know that you are walking with God through the wilderness. And that that contrast, you know. So I, I think a you know lessons of the wilderness kind of a sermon would be of, of all the ones we've mentioned would be the most topical in terms of the pandemic. Now, I think I've said several times on this in these conversations. You. You can't preach your big pandemic sermon every Sunday. People, you know, they all happen as it happens. They all know there's a pandemic going on. They've all come to their own conclusions about it. There is a place, you know, whether it's Easter, whether it's the first Sunday of Lent, whether it's Christmas to actually locate the fundamentals of the Christian faith within the context of the pandemic. I think this is a Sunday when you might want to do that because it's a big Sunday Lent one for, for yeah, me. I mean, this, I mean, the last Lent, was also a pandemic Sunday, but it felt very different. Um, and now is a Sunday where we can understand a bit more about our experiences of pan the pandemic. Angela Tilby did a great talk for the day this morning on how to engage with Lent when we're already deprived um, and the sort of religious side yeah. of entering consciously into the wilderness. Um, and yeah, I just don't, I wouldn't want to make that too individual. I mean, I think, I think there's a corporate wilderness. So, you know, that's quite a unique thing about this pandemic. We all you know, people get cancer, people lose their job. You know, we all have these experiences in our lives and or our families on a personal level. What What's unique is, you know, this isn't just a national thing. It's a it's a global thing. And the whole world is in the wilderness. And, and you know, that's well worth reflecting on because it is, you know, the, the basic assumption that we made some sort of a contract with God by which uh, if we were goody two shoes, we would be happy ever after, you know, it is so deep in people's consciousness. It's, it's just not true, but it's so deep in people's consciousness that the whole point of God is to make you happy. And if God won't do the decent thing and make us happy, then, you know, so much for God, we'll go and find something else that does, you know, that that's so far, that's so instrumentalizing. It's so far. Uh, from a true understanding of how God relates to us. so And we don't know. do that with any of our other relationships. You wouldn't marry someone on the condition that they always make you happy or, uh, um, <laughs> you, I don't know about your marriage, but like, I, mean, I, I, know, I, I wouldn't marry someone who always made me unhappy, but, 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 but uh, you know, you wouldn't expect a child to make you always happy. You wouldn't expect your parents to make you always happy. No. And, and yet you expect love and there's the different, you expect steadfast fidelity or you know whatever it is that is your definition oh, well, and, and, and so i mean that, that you know that, that would be among the lessons of the wilderness i think that it isn't actually uh about getting out of the wilderness it's about the relationships that you forge in the wilderness and man and does the, not live by bread alone um yeah wrong gospel but but yeah but the same right idea um there's um yeah. yeah i think it's a really interesting perspective um so uh last sunday night sam did a whole um uh, theology workshop which i think is available through the heart edge um page uh looking at suffering i missed it don't tell him um but um was there anything in that that came out that was particularly pertinent to this uh, well, we did. We did talk about this, the falsehood of this idea that we did a deal, uh, and that the point of life is to be happy, and and the point of God is to is to help us achieve that happiness more successfully than than the non non Christians or non believers. Uh, you know, I I think that needs ex exposing, and and it, and it, but also the 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 quest, the whole question on a you know on a really big canvas, of of what. You know what is Jesus? What is the incarnation fundamentally about? And you know the tendency of the traditional way of telling the story is that is that it was about making everything right. It was about fixing everything. You know, going back to Noah. Um, the trouble with that is it doesn't feel very fixed at the moment. So then you've got to ask the question: Well, was that really what it was all about, or was it about show, God showing in Christ that we we would never walk alone? You know, which tends to be my view, hence my concentration on the word "with." So I, I think these, uh, you know, this is a, this this um, wilderness idea is 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 a, you know, it's a it's a, you know, people quote uh, Columbus writing in his log for thirteen days crossing the Atlantic, no land in sight, kept sailing. You know, people have problems with analogies about Columbus in a in, in a 
you know, in an era where we're not sure that conquering America was such a great idea. But but um, but the point remains, it seems to me that, you know, that 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 is a person going through the wilderness, so, you know, who, who still yeah. trusts, even though uh, the evidence around them isn't all that promising. Um, I mean, it fits with Noah, at least. Um, if people were wanting to really invest in this and get know it not just as people preaching on Sunday, but really invest in it this Lent. Um, there's Sam's book, Nazareth Manifesto, always a great book to read during Lent or in any other season. Um, are there any other books that you recommend, either yours or other books that you've read that really help you flesh out the idea of the incarnation, not to pun? Um, oh, um, that's a good question. I'd need to th need to think uh, think a bit more about it, really, in terms of ones that. Well, suffering, be perhaps. What have you read that's been good on suffering? Well, I I I think it it does require quite a change. In uh, you know, uh, uh, it goes to the roots of Orthodox theology, and uh, I mean, you know, by Orthodox, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox. I mean the, the theology that is generally held across the, the mainstream churches. Uh, which I, I think is, you know, over focused on the idea that Jesus came to fix everything. And I think that ties in not so much to the scripture as to our notion that that's what success in life is about, to fix stuff. And I think that is a problematic notion. Uh, it's an underdeveloped area theologically, which is partly why I've tried to write about it myself. But uh, I haven't finished with that subject yet, so there's more to come. Um, uh, yes. So, I mean, but just just sort of summarising on 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 Lent, Lent one, I, I do, I, I do, you know, this isn't like the other two uh, years of the lectionary. This isn't the temptation sermon uh, for me. Um, we get much fuller accounts in Luke and Matthew, and save those for the next two years. I, I think this, but but also wilderness I, you know I, I really would commend to people I, you know I, I, I myself would probably be preaching on the the, the Noah passage the Genesis passage but I, I think for this time for such a time as this I think wilderness is probably the theme that comes out of the gospel that that speaks most most obviously it, it's kind of in a minor key it's it, it, it fits the state of mind of of most people that I'm you know encountering in the in the course of this pandemic and uh, and yeah and, and you know what we're going to have to face at the end of Lent is to what extent we portray Easter as the end of the pandemic because you know we yeah. we don't know what our leaders are going to tell us in, in a few days about I'm talking about the UK context now about uh, the relaxation of of the lockdown but. Uh, you know, we we're going to have to be careful with that because we probably played too many cards last summer uh, about coming out, coming out of something we then went back into. And I think there's also something about the ongoingness of grief. Um, I think there's a lot of people who've lost loved ones over the pandemic and that doesn't stop after a week or two. Um, I was even just having a pastoral conversation this morning about with someone who was saying it's just so wrong when young people die. And I said, yes, it, it does feel incredibly wrong. Um, like, like it just doesn't fit with what our brains tell us about life. Um, and I think there is something about the the incompleteness which will be with us even beyond Easter. And I guess talking about the resurrection this year will be very different to even last year when I think there hadn't been as many people who'd lost a loved one um, in this year. And, and I think even the tiredness of people, I think will make Easter feel very different. Um, it feels important though. It feels like we get a different glimpse on Easter um, this year and something I don't want to lose because I don't want to lose any glimpse of Easter um, or God. Um, well, again, Easter isn't about everything suddenly being happy. You know, it, it is about the, the contrast we started with an hour ago of the things that last forever and the things that don't last forever. So, you know, it, 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 it is the single thing that lasts forever. I mean, Easter is a forever day. Mm. Um, and 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 you know the fundamentals of the Christian faith haven't changed in the pandemic, and, and so we mustn't give the pandemic too much credibility, if you like. We must mm. we, we we have to put it in its place, mm. um, and, and but to do that in a way that doesn't show a lack of compassion for those who've been whose lives have been torn apart by the pandemic, of whom there are a great many. Yeah, we're in, all in a minor key to some extent. Mm. 
Well, thank you. Um, uh, there are some absolutely excellent Heart Edge events that we've been posted in uh, your underneath uh, this this video thing in Facebook. Uh, and in particular, I would like to draw your attention to um, well, there's a great, uh, looks like it'll be wonderful uh, conversation between Azra France Williams and Winnie Barghees about race, um, also um, some other things that are happening. Sam, anything you particularly want to draw out? Um, I think, no, I think you've done a good job. I mean, um, just go on the website and, and, and have a Yeah, have there's a loads look. of great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, also, um, I that if you're a member, if you are a church leader or a member of the clergy in any sense, um, there's also a community of practitioners because we know how hard and even lonely this season can be. So it's really important to be part of community. And, and if uh, you're looking for more community as you uh, serve and walk um, with your church, then the community of practitioners is there for you. It's a weekly meeting where they engage and support each other and uh, and build community around these sort of issues. Um, and uh, thank you for joining with us. And we'll be back again next Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I hope with anyone who's preaching on Sunday, it goes really well, whichever, whatever you're preaching on, whatever angle. Um, and uh, we'll be back again next week. Thanks.